Hi, this is Roger Marsh, and today is Cyber Monday, November 26th. Here at Family Talk, we hope that you are staying on top of your to-do list, but don't forget that the season is about giving more than receiving. In that spirit, we are blessed at our ministry to have been given a matching grant. So today and all this week, including Giving Tuesday, your donation to us will be doubled. It is because of listeners just like you that we are able to provide you with valuable content that will strengthen your family. To find out more, go to drjamesdobson.org. Today on Family Talk. Well, hello, everyone. You're listening to Family Talk, a radio production of the James Dobson Family Institute. I'm your host, Dr. James Dobson, and I pray that you have had a wonderful Thanksgiving this last week. This, of course, is a Monday, and I hope you had a wonderful weekend with your family. Thursday, of course, was Thanksgiving Day. And uh, we uh, celebrated with our grandchildren, which is a great way to spend that uh, holiday. Shirley and I love this time of year, and I hope that you do too. Now, uh, I've got to talk a little bit about myself in order to introduce one of my books that you probably have heard about. I have written some 71 books. There are 35 of them that we talk about regularly and that most of them are still in print. But the most successful book has been my first book, Dare to Discipline, which was published in 1970. That book arrived on August the 31st, the same day that we adopted Ryan Dobson into our family, and both of those events turned my boat upside down. So uh, I have a lot of memories of Dare to Discipline. There's stories I could tell you about that, but we're not going to talk about that one. We're going to talk about the second best-selling book that I have written, and it's called The Strong-Willed Child. When I wrote that book, frankly, it was in contradiction to a lot of what I had been taught in graduate school about the nature of children. Uh, In a strange kind of way, in those days, uh, child developmentalists and pediatricians and professors and others uh, tried to tell us that children are born Uh, They come into the world as a blank slate, that they have no inborn temperaments and personality, but the environment comes along and stamps into those little youngsters uh, their uniqueness that becomes so well known to all of us. That is wrong. I knew it very quickly. I think I knew it even in graduate school uh, because little children are incredibly complex at the moment of birth. They come into the world with this uh, array of, of personalities and temperaments and things that make them unique from every other individual that has ever lived on the face of the earth. They look different. We're all unique. We're all different. How foolish of us to think otherwise. If every snowflake that falls in the wintertime is different from every other snowflake. And if you look at them under a microscope, you will see that they're unique. And if every grain of sand at the beach is unique, uh, how crazy to think that God rubber stamps human beings, the most complex creatures on earth. And uh, our brains are designed for a particular purpose. Uh, You know, my father had four brothers, so there were five boys in that family. And uh, if you knew them, you would know that there was almost no communality between them except for the twins. The first two were named Robert and Lee, and they were tremendous athletes. One went on to be a head football coach at one of the largest high schools in Shreveport, Louisiana, and the other one uh, could have played professional football if there had been an NFL at that time. The third child to come along was a mama's boy, and he was kind of a sissy. Uh, He didn't play football. He didn't play baseball. Uh, He played the piano. Uh, He was very sensitive. He was totally different than his two older brothers. The fourth one to come along was a businessman, great money sense, and they say he kept part of every dollar he ever made. 
My dad to come along had no business sense whatsoever. He was not a football player. He was not a piano player. My dad was an artist. And all he cared about was sitting out in a field looking at a tree, and he could sit there all day. It was amazing how those five children were different. Now, when people meet me on the street, one of the questions they often ask is that I have two children or I have three or four or five children, and every one of them is different. I don't know why they're so different because I raised them the same. The reason is because they were born different. So we're going to talk about the strong-willed child today because in a few minutes, you're going to hear the first part of my conversation. It's actually a three-part or three-day conversation with three mothers of strong-willed children. And uh, they're going to share their stories and their experiences, and some of them are funny. Um, But also, they're going to talk about the difficulties of raising a really tough child. Before we listen to my conversation, I want to tell you about these three ladies. The first is Deborah Merritt, who's a retired teacher and mother of four. The second is Kristen Walker, a high school teacher and mom to four kids as well. And uh, she has brought her daughter along with her, uh, and her name is Liz, and you're going to hear her chime in in a moment. And then the third is Joy Solomon, who was the inspiration behind this meaningful conversation. Uh, I love talking to these ladies because they're very candid and very open about what parenthood has been like for them and what we can learn from their strong-willed children. So let's listen now as I explain what brought these wonderful women together. I want to start by telling you how this program came about. I was in uh, Alabama several months ago with Shirley, and we were having lunch kind of as an, on an outdoor porch, as I recall, and happened to be sitting across from Joy and Davey, and didn't know them, began to get acquainted. Mm-hmm. And uh, how did the conversation start, Joy? I think you, you... Well, I think it started when we first met. It was so funny when you said, hi, I'm Jim. Like, we wouldn't recognize that voice immediately. It was <laughs> overwhelming. And I said, well, I'm Joy, but I'm surprised you don't remember me because you lived with us for a while. <laughs> and you said, I did. And I said, yes, for about three years when we were really working with that strong-willed child. And he said, oh, you have one of those. And I said, yes. And you asked how old he was. And I said, well, it's a she. And she is now 19 and doing very well, but you had your struggles. Very dark days. Now, Joy, the reason that I wanted you to be here today, we've kind of built a program around what you said to me that day, is that you're kind of a quintessential mother of a strong-willed child. You experienced those frustrations that I was trying to talk about and describe a few minutes ago. And the guilt and the self-condemnation and the self-doubt, all Mm -hmm. of that was there for you from very, very early, wasn't it? Yes. How soon after your daughter was born did you know that she was going to take you on? I think probably when you bring them home from the hospital, there's that clue that comes on. Um, Our son was only nine months old when I was ready to have another baby because I was an exceptional mom. Mm. He slept eight hours a night at 12 weeks old. He woke up in his bed and played until you went to get him. Well, I knew that was a sure, you got fully credit attributable for that, to me right? <laughs> as a mother. And I said, oh, I'm ready for another one. And I think unwittingly, we sort of dare God because, number one, I was never going to have a picky eater. And number two, I would not tolerate a thumb sucker. Well, Jason, we have to buy stock in Oscar Mayer because he lived off of hot dogs in Bologna. He was the pickiest eater. And then I would not have had a thumb sucker, and Dana would have given up her parents before she gave up her thumb. <laughs> and I was the wonderful mom, so all of my kids were going to be great. See, and- I, I think it was in Parenting Isn't for Cowards that I talked about the fact that 
nature kind of does a, a number on parents that give you an easy kid mm-hmm. first and you congratulate yourself on what a great parent you are and bam here comes this little tiger the little as Dana. i said smoking a cigar i think and, she slept through the night at maybe 15 months old and at 18 months old you could tell her no and she would fall on the floor and throw her fit and roll around and we would sit and watch her for a while because we weren't going to give in we were going to be strong and she would stand up and she would have that beautiful angelic face and she would say i'm sorry and she would come over and lay her head in my lap and then she would bite me and that was the first clue because it was a manipulation she made sure that you weren't worried about what she was going to do. And she was very, very tough. Very tough. And she knows that you're here today. Yes, she does. And she has given permission she for did. you to tell this story yes. because it does have a happy ending. And in fact, that's one of the things we want to say to parents who are out there. Just don't panic. Hang in there. But you still have to know how to cope with it. But the amount of intelligence and the strong will And when you take a keen intelligence and a strong will, and especially for us at age 16, when the spirit turns defiant, you're in a world of hurt. Now, Joy, I'm anxious to get to the others of you, but but, uh, I really want you to help folks understand this who have never seen a strong-willed child. Uh, You know, I I know some families with six or seven or eight kids, and not a one of them has this temperament. Mm -hmm. And you need to help people understand uh, just what it's like. This is not just disobeying occasionally. I mean, every child does this. This is not even uh, just toddler tantrums. This is a war of wills from the very early moments of life. Yes. I remember a key time for us was... um, she was five years old and she was a physically strong child and there was an episode where she had been out throwing rocks at cars and i called her in and i said dana why were you throwing rocks at cars and she said well i did warn them as they went down the street i told them if they came back by and they didn't belong on my street that i'd have to throw a rock at their car so i only threw rocks at cars i only threw rocks at cars that didn't belong on our street and I said we live on a cul-de-sac where were they going and she had that look that she would give you when you just really weren't understanding what she was saying and she said that's not my fault so it was understandable to her we were on a cul-de-sac so it wasn't her fault that someone had built the street that way I took her in to spank her and she said you're not going to spank me I'm going to wait until my daddy gets home well you've met Davy. he is a large man Her concept for that was the longer you put off the spanking, the longer time she had to work up her defense, why she should be right in what she was doing and did not deserve a spanking. And I said, no, I'm going to spank you now. And she said, no, you're not. You will not spank me. And I said, yes, I will. And that day, I think, was a terrifying day because I physically could not control her. She threw every ounce of strength and strong will into fighting me, and it was a battle that probably lasted an hour and a half. And this child was five years old. How did it end? It ended with me putting her out in the garage, and she was walking around screaming, and she rang the doorbell, and she said, I'll take my spanking now. Because if ever you let them win the smallest yeah, battles, yeah, yeah. it's lost. Mm-hmm. And I, I spanked her. And a good friend of ours, a pastor in Columbus, I went to see him and I said, I'm at my wit's end. You know, I don't physically know how to control this child. And he said, every night when you put her to bed, I want you and Davy to go in and I want you to lay hands on her while she's asleep. And what you're going to pray is for the Holy Spirit to conquer the strong will while not destroying her spirit, because that's what makes her who Dana is. And we did that every night. We would go in and we would pray over her and lay hands on her. And it was probably about six months later. She got up one morning and she said, you know, I'm bad sometimes. And I said, I know. And she said, I don't mean the things I say. I'm not going to do that anymore. And probably for the next 
five years, 10 years, somewhere mm-hmm. around in that range. While it wasn't gone, she yeah. was able to control yeah. it. And then she hit adolescence. You were not a pushover, were you, Joy? No. I mean, you were no. determined to discipline this kid. And my this hus- is not a matter of a mom who's out of control and is letting a kid get away with murder. We were to the point where I remember one night we were at a restaurant, and I innocently said, does anyone need to go to the bathroom? And they both started screaming at the top of their lungs because going to the bathroom meant a spanking because I never <laughs> spanked them out. And, and I said, no, I just meant to go to the bathroom. I didn't mean you, you've been bad. Dana saw every, spank, every bathroom in Columbus, Georgia, no. because we would go in for a spanking, go in for a spanking, because she was just that defiant, strong-willed spirit. All right, I have one more story I want you to tell, and then we'll get to the others. Uh, your son decided to run away from home. He did. All right, I want you – this is what uh, we heard <laughs> at the um, luncheon that we had in Alabama. And I would do – we called it, lovingly, the Dr. Dobson spill, where I would say, oh, Mother w- loves you so much, and, and you have to be my big boy, and you go through that, and you go through that. Every time he would say, I'm going to run away from home – Well, one night it just struck me, okay, this is it. So he was in his little pajamas, and he said, if you make me go to bed, I'm going to run away from home. So I said, well, we'll see you later, buddy. You know, have a nice trip. So he rang the doorbell, and he said, I didn't mean tonight. And I said, well, I do. I'm really tired of this. It's time for you to go. But let me pack you a bag. You'll need pajamas and things. And he said, well, I might need to think about this. And I said, well, you've got about three minutes while I go pack your bag. I said, it's important to me that you stay here and be our son, but this is your decision. Either you run away or I never hear this again. You decide to live here, and I don't hear that again. So I went and I packed, you know, got the suitcase. I don't think I put anything in it. And I went back and I opened the door, and he said, well, I've been thinking about it, and I guess I'm going to stay. And I said, but never say that to me again. Do you understand? He said, yes, ma'am. And for, from then on, he would say, if you make me do that, I, I, I'm not going to be your best friend. <laughs> and I'd say, well, that's sad. But what works for one has to work for the other. Yeah. Because I was the stay-at-home mom, and Dana was going through her, I'm going to run away from home. I'm going to run away from home. So one night. I had had it, and I said, well, I'll see you later. And it's funny, the pictures that stay in your mind. She had on a strawberry shortcake robe and strawberry shortcake slippers and her little blonde hair. And I went and sat down, and Tavy looked at me, and he said, well, she's been out there about five minutes. Do you think, you know, maybe she should have rang the doorbell? And I said, no, she's got that defiant spirit. We're going to give her about 10 minutes. So I went to the front door. There was nobody there. And only by the grace of God did we live on that cul-de-sac because there was a street lamp and she was down at the street lamp with her thumb out. She was hitching a ride. How old was she now? She was probably six at this point. <laughs> She's going to catch a ride. She was catching a ride. Had in, no in fear her, whatsoever. In her robe. In the robe, the slippers, needed nothing else. <laughs> you told me I could run away. And I thought, <laughs> This isn't what I'm supposed to be dealing with. You see why I wanted yes. Joy here. That's Kristen, right. tell us your story. Well, <laughs> um, in hindsight, I think we knew shortly after birth, uh, at 10 days old, she went into the hospital with spinal meningitis. You're speaking Liz, of Liz. Liz. Mm, okay. And um, as they were trying to get uh, a spinal tap fluid, uh, instead of compliantly going into a, a fetal position as they held her down, she would arch her back at 10 days old and ended up going through uh, 10 or 12 spinal taps uh, before mm. they could get untainted spinal fluid to, to culture to see if she really had spinal meningitis. And in fact, it was so bad they ended up going through her brain to get to the mm. base of her uh, her spine to do that. And then at 18 months, we were visiting some friends and for dinner and uh, my two older kids were there, and they had cut glass candy dishes at each end of their couch. They didn't have any children yet. They could do that. Mm-hmm. And um, I n- told my two oldest children, you know, these are glass. They'll break. Don't touch them. Don't play rough around here. I didn't even mention them to Liz. I thought, I'll deal with that when the time comes. <laughs> and when she finally saw them after dinner, we went through that. no, you're not going to touch that. No, mm-hmm. we're not going to touch that. <laughs> and one finger and everything else. And um, my friend, after the battle was over, she said, do you realize you spanked her hand nine times? 
to get her to understand. Now, she understood. She understood for that no, moment. No question about the fact that you were saying, no, oh, don't do this. She understood. Yeah. But she was simply saying, I think I can outlast you. Oh, yes. Yeah. And the, in my mind, probably the epitome war that we fought, she was probably five. And I had been homeschooling the kids. Um, my husband's Air Force, and so we were living in Alabama at the time. And um, we were homeschooling the kids, and she decided she wasn't getting enough attention one day. And so I pulled her up on my lap, and, and while she was sitting on my lap and I was still trying to teach, she started kicking me with one of her legs. Well, I, I put the, her leg between my legs so she couldn't kick me anymore. Well, that didn't work, so she started kicking me with the other one. So I put both legs between her. Then she started pinching or scratching. We ended up on the floor. She was spread eagle <laughs> on the floor. I was holding her down so that she could not hurt me or try to do damage to me. And she's screaming, let go of me, let go of me. And I'm saying, we're here until you calm down. Yeah. And she quit crying and I'd start to pray. And she'd immediately start screaming again, don't you pray for me. Uh -huh. and so we'd start again. And this was a good 45 minute battle. Liz, do you remember that? I remember several times where I would just argue and seriously, I would end up on the floor with mother on top of me saying, who's going to win? Who's going to win? She would just go on, go on and go on for, I mean, hours even sometimes. Do you just remember how you felt during those battles? Determined to win. You just, I just going to win it. Um, I'm stronger than mom. You know, it was just the whole idea of being rebellious and um, doing what I wanted to do. Deborah, let's hear just a little bit. We've only got about three or four minutes left, and we'll start with you next time. Uh, tell us about your strong-willed child. Well, I kind of have two strong-willed children. I thought that I had one. My first daughter, when she was born, she had a little bit of what Liz went through. We did the, you can't you can't do this, and then I would have to go through a little bit of the sitting on her and making sure she obeyed. And I had one child at the time. For two and a half years, I had one child. She was my focus, and I could do all the things right. I yeah. could say, no, we're going to do it this way. She would rip wallpaper off the wall. She would do all these things that I thought were just awful. Well, it turned out she was sick. She was asthmatic, and she didn't feel well. When she didn't feel well, she was cranky. So it made it a totally different child yeah. out of her when we took her to the doctor and found out that there was a good reason why she was just frustrated and she was upset. So truly, I don't believe that she was a strong-willed child. Two children later, I had another child. That definitely was a strong-willed child. She was bona fide. <laughs> she, she was a strong-willed child before she was born. She was part of a twin set. She oh, has a boy. twin brother. And my only prayer had been, you were talking about how God is funny sometimes. My only mm -hmm. prayer had been, if I'm going to have a boy-girl twin set, which I kind of felt that I would have, I want the boy to be the football player and the girl to be the nice, sweet little cheerleader. And in reality, it's my daughter that's being recruited by the football team at this point. <laughs> And my son is, is a wonderful child, and he writes tender poetry. He'll be the best pediatrician in the whole world. So I had kind of a flip-flop there, too. When you say you knew it before birth, the, I think in the film series I said long before birth, the kid's been scratching initials on the walls. Is, is that the kind of thing? The you... night before they were born, I was scheduled for C-sections. I don't dilate, so I had scheduled C-sections for all of my, my deliveries. And I was playing games with some friends next door, and I had this eruption like a volcano or an earthquake in my stomach. And I know that it's probably not possible, but I swear she switched places with him. Like he was supposed to be the lower <laughs> child to come out first, and she just went, Shoo. I had this horrible thing. I woke up in the morning thinking that my water had broken. In reality, I was kind of laying in a pool of blood. That child was going to come out of that cervix, whether it dilated or not. And I it was raised to the hospital, and I went into emergency surgery at that point. But she was going to come out no matter what she had to face. Huh. So talk about being born, smoking a cigar, yelling orders at the nursing staff, complaining about the temperature. She was there. And early on then. Oh, yes. Yeah, in the oh, first yes. year even. I you would know say... No, from the day we brought her home. Yeah. Her dad has a personality very similar to her. He's kind of known as Attila the Hun at work, and so she favored her dad. <laughs> and I had twins. I had two children. I had a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and then I had these two babies. No grandparents um, lived close by. They would come and visit and help us, but I was busy. I was a very busy young mother, and yes, she would scream and scream and scream. And I thought, well, she's sick. She has problems. She's got colic or whatever. Dad would walk in the room. Talk about a baby flirting and cooing, you know, that sweet little thing. That's all she wanted was dad. So I thought, you can raise this child. I'll raise the other three <laughs> because she's stronger will than I am by a long shot. How difficult was that for you emotionally? 
Um, it was very difficult because I, I was a mother at heart. I'd always wanted to be a mom. I had good relationships. As I said, I'd worked through all those difficulties with my first child, my second child. Her name means gracious gift of God. She's precious. She does what she can to help me to serve. She's just a wonderful child. And then I get this child that's like, my relatives, my in-laws, everybody called her the kid and a half. It's like, well, there's Debbie and the twins, but it's like three and a half kids. It's like, this, this child is worth at least one and a half children. This is Roger Marsh, and I hope you enjoyed hearing from these moms today here on Family Talk. Although their stories made us all laugh, there is a serious side to this issue as well. If you are dealing with a child who is acting out, we want to help you. Don't let tension and frustration build up in your home. Discover hope through these trying circumstances. To get your copy of The Strong-Willed Child, go to drjamesdobson.org and then click onto the broadcast page. Well, we've only scratched the surface on this topic, so be sure to join us again tomorrow as we continue this discussion. That's coming up next time right here on Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.